We are going to start in five seconds. This meeting is now called to order. Roll call, please. Mrs. Cloninger. Here. Mrs. Cons. Here. Mr. Lavalley. Here. Mr. Salt. Here. Mr. Timby. Here. The Pledge of Allegiance will be led by Mr. Aaron Salt. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Ms. Matson Bonet, are there any updates to the agenda? There were no updates to the agenda this week. Members of the board, are there any items you wish to move from the consent agenda? Any items to be added to the agenda? May we have a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Second. Roll call, please. Mrs. Cloninger. Aye. Mrs. Cons. Aye. Mr. Lavalley. Aye. Mr. Salt. Aye. Mr. Temby. Aye. The board quote, Mr. Salt. Thank you. My quote is, our leaders must remember that education doesn't begin with some isolated bureaucrat in Washington. It doesn't even begin with state or local officials. Educa education begins in the home where it is a parental right and responsibility. And that's from uh, President Ronald Reagan. Thank you, Mr. Salt. Board comments, Colonel Sullivan. Uh, you got me right out of the box this time. It's the first time I've gone first, so <laughs> thrown off. But I just want to give a quick update on the Air Academy High School basketball team for those who may have seen it or if you didn't, but lost the heartbreaker to Mesa Ridge, 71 to 68 in the final on Saturday, but really great season. The way that team came together and watched them over the year, I, it was less about basketball for me than just the team. It was really neat to see. So that's my update from Yusafa and Mr. Gregor is gracious enough to to let me say that today. Thank you. Thank you, Colonel Sullivan. Ms. Cloninger. I have nothing. Ms. Cons. I feel like I should be shamed into not doing this because we're supposed to keep our comments brief, but I just wanted to share a few wonderful things that all of our kids and schools and uh, teachers are doing over the last couple weeks. So two nights ago, was it? Thank you. Um, Mrs. Hester invited me to see her son and these amazing bands at Liberty. Um, the Youth Symph Symphonic Band and uh, Wind Ensemble truly brought tears to my eyes. I cannot recommend enough to go see the high school bands if, uh, if you ever can and hear about them because extraordinary. And then um, if you didn't notice, how could you not? The art show that's going on outside and all upstairs this turtle caught my eye because my husband loves turtles, took a picture. It's a friend we know from Liberty, um, Bella Barrington, way to go. But um, please vote. Well, I don't know if it, that's just for staff for voting, but look at all the art in our halls because it's mind blowing. So that's from Liberty. Got to go to TCA, Sock Hop. All the, all the three elementary schools came together, had a ton of good 50s fun. So that was great. Bald for Bucks, as most of you know, um, was at Rampart last week. As of that day, I think they had raised $42,000 this year. Um, they're over $600,000 for the 15 year history, raising money for the Leukemia and Lymphoma Foundation. Um, so lots of excellent things going on there. Got to honor the little, the tiniest boy in the bottom left here for um, Keenan, Ke Ke um, who, had leukemia when he was three and is in remission now. And then a few of us got to attend the Air Force Junior ROTC Ball this past weekend. So got to see some kiddos from our church. I'm super proud of this whole group of students that's in that are in J. Um, just their honor and integrity and and hard work is is so commendable. Uh, almost 300 students in this program from our district. So really awesome. And I believe that's it. So thank you, Mr. Lavalley. Thank you, Ms. Cons. Mr. Temby. Uh, my only comment is um, <clears throat> thanks to our superintendent finalists uh, coming forward and being courageous enough to put yourself forward. So we're looking forward to hearing your comments tonight. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Temby. Mr. Salt. Thank you. Just a couple, uh, as uh, Ms. Kahn's mentioned, uh, a couple of us went to the AFJROTC ball uh, this past Saturday. And I just want to commend all of those cadets that are there. Uh, there are some incredible leaders coming out of this district that are going through that program, and I can't wait to see what they do in the future. Uh, and then I went to the uh, capping ceremony at Pine Creek last night. Uh, Ms. Cloninger's son was uh, one of those. capping ceremony uh, and it was uh, so I got to run into to several people that I know up there including um, the the wing commander uh, who sat at my table at the at the military ball so he was up there and uh, got to connect with him and his parents again so uh, and again we just talked about the leadership of the kids that are going through this district and um, it's how incredible it is so aside from that uh, I also would like to thank our candidates for coming out and uh, putting themselves out there and uh, looking forward to the presentations tonight so thank you Thank you, Mr. Salt. Uh, I have a few things and I'll try to be brief since I'm the one that sent the email to everybody saying be brief. I, I will try to lead by example here. Um, this is the first time I, I, I've been on the board in over five years that we have not had public comments. So it's very unusual, but we all we we you know mentioned that plenty early so everybody understood why um, and rest assured they will be back at the next meeting. I attended the Battle of the Books at Mountain Ridge Middle School. Uh, it was great to see academic competition. You know, we, we see sporting competition all the time, which is a good thing but not as much academic competition. It was really fun. Uh, four of our middle schools uh, competed. It was just great, them all reading so many books to try to learn to be able to compete and do well. Um, I attended one of the school start times town halls last week, and I want to thank all the staff who took part. Uh, there were a lot of tough questions, and I thought they did a really gr a great job. Uh, I think it's great we are doing these, these town halls so people are aware of, we're not doing things in a vacuum, we're really trying to get to, uh, hear from the community. <clears throat> I visited Rampart last Friday and I dropped in on uh, Barbara Taylor Cerati's uh, American Lit class. Uh, that was the first thing I did and then I went to Mr. Nick Sirakis and I, Nick's usually here. I don't know if he's here but we've talked for like two years when, when we approved his Black History course several years ago. I said, Nick, I'd, I'd love to come into your class. I promise I have no agenda. I just want to hear her. and we finally pulled it off um, last week and it was great. He's a he's a great teacher, and, and I learned a lot about history. This was a, I believe, it was an IB history class. He was kind of comparing um, Eisenhower and Kennedy and Truman and um, uh, Woodrow Wilson. So it was it was just fascinating. I thought that was it was great. And and then I stayed for Bald for Bucks, uh, which I think Ms. Kanji talked about. That was a great it was a great event. Um, and I also attended the military ball put on by the junior ROTC detachment at Rampart High School. It was awesome. Uh, it, it was, I just love that, that, that event. Uh, junior ROTC is such a great program. You know, the kids are, well, they go through a receiving line and you get to shake their hands. It's, you know, a, a couple times it's like, okay, is this your date? Well, who is your date? Introduce your date to us. You know, little customs and courtesies. I just, it was just great. Um, and I want to thank uh, Colonel Rob Huber and the others uh, that, that put that on. They just do a great, great work. And uh, finally today, I attended the CASB President's Cafe. Um, we talked about recruiting board candidates. What information do candidates need to know and how do we get that information and that sort of thing. So that was uh, kind of took up my last two weeks. Uh, I want to do an update on the superintendent search. I think most people are aware of what's going on, but last night at Liberty High School, all four were able to do their 20-minute tw presentation, which they will now do tonight. And then there was sort of a meet and greet afterwards. Um, the executive session will be tomorrow morning. We will do interviews and uh, there is feedback available. The form is online right now until uh, 10 o'clock tomorrow morning, I believe. Is that is that right? Yeah, that's the time. Um, and then there will be a special meeting. Uh, the plan is March 23rd at 5 p.m. to announce uh, the new superintendent. Administrative comments, Mr. Gregory. Yes, Mr. Smart, please. I think he has some introductions. Hello, hello. Okay, so I'll make sure it worked this time. Uh, good evening. Uh, we have a couple of individuals we're going to recommend to you for administrative positions. And as always, they've met all state licensing requirements, uh, all school district prerequisites, and they've success successfully navigated our interview process. And so let me start with our first person tonight. I'm going to introduce Patrick Perry, who is being recommended as a school in the woods administrator. 
Uh, Patrick is joined this evening by most of the staff at School in the Woods. So just so you know. Uh, he holds a Bachelor's of Arts in Sociology from Colorado State University in Fort Collins, Colorado. Also a Master's of Arts in Elementary Education from Colorado College in Colorado Springs. He began his educational career in District 5 in Centennial, uh, Colorado at Dry Creek Elementary School. Um, you're going to notice a theme here. And then he went to District 2 and he taught at Oak Creek Elementary School. Can't just stay away from the Greeks. Um, and then he went abroad to Athens, Greece and taught fourth grade at American Community Schools of Athens. And then upon returning to the United States, he served as the director of High Trails Outdoor Education Center, which a lot of our students go to on an annual basis. Um, and now he's currently serving as a teacher at School in the Woods. And there's a fun fact about Patrick. So I've heard that if you blindfold him and take him to anywhere in the 500 acres that surrounds School in the Woods and take off the blindfold, he has no cell phone, no GPS, he can find his way back to the school without any help. I got 50 yards off the trail and I had to call in search and rescue. So <laughs> next time I'm calling him. Um, so we are pleased to recommend Patrick uh, to you tonight for the position of School in the Woods Administrator. Patrick, you wanna say anything? I just wanted to say thank you to the board. Thank you to the community at School in the Woods and all the staff, the students that are out there and all the stakeholders in this district. My gratitude is so deep. I don't know how to verbalize it, so I'll do my best to work as hard as I can to increase the academic rigor at School in the Woods, to continue our great traditions. And I want to finish with, if you guys will help me, once a naturalist, Thank you, Patrick. Uh, the next person I'd like to introduce is Matt Mitchell, who has been recommended as the principal at Discovery Canyon Campus High School. Matt is joined this evening by his wife, Lindsay, his son, Luke, his daughter, Abby, and his mom, Ginger. Uh, so uh, Matt holds um, several degrees. He holds, he holds a Bachelor's of Arts in History with secondary education emphasis from the University of Northern Colorado, a Master's of Arts in History from Colorado State University in Pueblo, and also a Master's of Arts in Educational Leadership and Policy Studies from UNC, which everybody loves policy, so it's exciting. Uh, he began his career in District 2 at Fox Meadow Middle School as a Social Studies teacher, and then Sierra High School as a Social Studies teacher, and then Fox Middle, Middle School as a Dean of Students. And he currently serves as the Assistant prin Principal at Sierra High School. And I wanna tell you, we got to go visit the school and talk to students and talk to staff and talk to parents. And it was a great opportunity just to get to know him a little bit. The students were great. Um, it was a great opportunity uh, to kind of see where he's at right now. And so we appreciate that. Um, we're pleased uh, to introduce uh, Matt tonight for the principal uh, for Discovery County Campus High School. Is there anything you'd like to say tonight? All right. Well, I'd like to thank the board for the opportunity. It's great to meet you all last week and I'm excited to serve this community, um, it's hard leaving where you're coming from, or where you're coming from, but it's really exciting to go where you're headed. I had an opportunity to sneak into Discovery Canyon a couple of times this past week and see some events, and I'm very, very much looking forward to serving that community. Uh, leadership is a is a privilege and a true duty, and I am excited to serve and serve the community of Discovery Canyon campus. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. We are all cautiously optimistic that that you will get through consent. So, uh, all right. Administ let's see. Uh, administrative comments. Oh, continue, uh, Mr. Mitchell. By the way, I I see you've already bought new clothes. <laughs> you got to have the school colors on, right? I do have a few. Um, I apologize. It's very loud. Uh, and some of this will be a repetitive, but a little bit more detail. For the 16th year in a row, Rampart High School hosted its Bald for Bucks fundraiser, and to date has raised over 50, new update on the number, Ms. Cons, has raised uh, $50,700 for the Lymphoma and Leukemia Society. More than 100 people shaved or cut their hair, including students from Mountain Ridge Middle School, Academy International, Ranch Creek, Encompass Heights, Academy Endeavor, 
and High Plains Elementary Schools. Those students all attended the event. This year's hero child, uh, as Ms. Khan said, is Keenan Rodriguez, a High Plains Elementary School student. He's now in remission from a rare blood cancer. And coincidentally, on the day of the Bald for Bucks assembly, it was his sixth birthday also. So we had the entire gym. And if you've never been there for that event, the gym is packed. Uh, probably exceeds fire code, but um, it's packed. Uh, he had the entire gym singing him happy birthday uh, and a special thanks to the student council and all the students and staff at Rampart for putting a community event together that's um, one of a kind, uh, especially in the central part of, of the school district. So thanks to them. Uh, congratulations to Dick Wagner, a bus mechanic with the transportation department. When he's not working on our buses, uh, he is a professional umpire. This week he learned he'll be umpiring the Little League World Series in Pennsylvania next August. If successful, he could be chosen to umpire the final games in front of approximately 40,000 people which if you haven't watched the Little League World, I have not been fortunate enough to go there. I've coached Little League, but uh, I watch it on TV every year and I would love to be there. So congratulations to him. Uh, congratulations to the Air Academy High School Winter Guard team. On Saturday, the team took first place at the Rocky Mountain Color Guard Association contest. They're heading to regionals this week in Denver. And also Air Academy, I just wanna echo Colonel Sullivan's comments about the basketball team at Air Academy and the great uh, event Saturday night. Unfortunately, they lost, but it was a close. And again, a time again in a post COVID era, just great to see a whole lot of white shirts. They were all in white. Uh, um, students, staff, community, uh, parents, uh, Colonel Sullivan and his family uh, were all at the event. And it was just a, unfortunately they lost, but it was still a great, a great event and great night for them. Uh, congratulations to Caleb Chung, a senior at Pine Creek High School, for receiving the Coca-Cola Scholar Award. He's less than 1% of 91,000 plus applicants to earn this distinguished award. Recipients of this scholarship, uh, and I quote, exemplify superior leadership, service, and academics, and are also change agents and positively affect others and their community. And if you don't know Caleb, I'm this is one of many awards he will probably have this spring. So uh, last month or last meeting, we talked about some of the National Merit Scholars that uh, we were aware of. There are more now, we learned of more. From Discovery Canyon campus, uh, Deshna Jane Kishore um, is a National Merit Scholar and so is Sharia Roy. And from Pine Creek High School, Caleb Chung, Nathan George, Dana Coe, and Eve Maramba. So we've rounded out and we still, I think, have one more school to, to find out about, but I think we're up to about 10, 11 so far in the district. So with that's that's all I have. It's all on you. Thank you, Mr. Gregory. We have 59 people attending virtually. Uh, consent agenda, we need a motion to approve the following resolutions. Resolution 16723, approval of matters relating to administrative staff, licensed. Resolution 16823, approval of matters relating to administrative staff classified. Resolution 16923, approval of matters relating to licensed staff teachers. Resolution 17023, approval of matters relating to licensed staff, licensed support slash special services provider. Resolution 17323, approval of matters relating to classified staff. Resolution 17223, approval of matters relating to executive cabinet staff. Resolution 17323, Approval of monitoring report for executive limitation policy 2.7, employment compensation and benefits. Resolution 17423, approval of monitoring report evaluation MRE for executive limitations policy 2.7, employment compensation and benefits. Resolution 17523, approval of the Board of Education discretionary budget for fiscal year 2324. Approval of the Board of, Board of Education special meeting minutes from March 1st, 2023. And the approval of the Board of Education regular meeting minutes from March 2nd, 2023. And finally, the approval of the Board of Education special meeting minutes from March 3rd, 2023. So moved. Second. Roll call, please. Mrs. Cloninger? Aye. Mrs. Cons? Aye. Mr. Lavalley? Aye. Mr. Salt? Aye. Mr. Temby? Aye. Okay, we will take a seven minute break to congratulate our, uh, our new administrators in, in District 20. Thank you.
Congratulations. Very nice move on the top. Yeah, absolutely. Good luck there. Hope it's a Thanks, sir. Yeah, hi. Nicole. I'm sorry, I was out of town. Oh, that's all right. Last week, sorry. Yeah, nice to meet you. Yeah, I'm so glad for you. Good. It's an amazing school, so hopefully, you know, Dr. Wallstrom's built. Feels good. Have you been meeting with him? Yeah, we're excited. I just love what they're doing. I'm so glad for you.
We are back. The next part of our meeting will be a special presentation by each of our superintendent finalists. We are nearing the end of our work that has spanned three and a half months. And as part of our public interview process, we have asked each candidate to make two public presentations. Their first was last night. And as the foundation of these presentations, we've asked them to address two primary question interview questions. One is why they chose to apply to Academy District 20. And two, why their leadership style is a good fit for Academy District 20. I also want to remind those in our audience, as well as those joining us online, that we are providing an opportunity for public comments on each candidate's presentation. You can find a link on the district's homepage to the comment form, and that link will be available until 10 a.m. tomorrow, which is Friday morning. We are eager to hear now from our candidates. Um, just as a, an, an FYI to our four candidates, we may be taking notes up here, we may not. Don't read into anything if we do, and don't read into anything if we don't. So uh, it means absolutely nothing, just FYI. But uh, without further ado, I'd like to invite, invite Dr. Walt Cooper, our search consultant who has been leading us through this process, to the podium to introduce our first candidate. Thank you, President Lavalley. And uh, we are indeed in the home stretch um, after almost four months of work, uh, which will culminate. Um, as uh, Mr. Lavalley said tomorrow with the each candidate's individual time with you. But before then, we have one last challenge, uh, if you will, for each candidate. Uh, and I want to echo Mr. Temby's um, acknowledgement of the courage it takes for uh, candidates to do this. This is um, by far the most um, uh, rigorous uh, and involved uh, process for candidates of any search that I've been involved in. So. Um, we have um, not only done a lot of due diligence, we've also put them through the ringer and, and each of them have, have handled it marvelous, marvelously. Um, so without any further ado, um, each candidate has 15 minutes um, to make their presentation to you. They can see uh, the countdown on the, on the screen behind you. Um, and so uh, our first candidate, we drew random numbers last night, uh, or numbers at random last night for order. Uh, and so tonight, our first candidate is Miss Becky Allen. And so I will invite Ms. Allen to the podium. It is yours. Good evening. My name is Becky Allen, and I serve as the Chief Financial Officer here in Academy District 20. Thank you so much for this opportunity tonight to speak about the school district that I love. I see a lot of familiar faces here tonight. I see some I don't know. So I'm going to take a moment to just introduce myself. Then I will talk about why I would like to serve as your superintendent. And then I will explain a little bit about what my leadership looks like from day to day. First of all, I was born in New Jersey. I grew up there. I didn't move here until I was 25 years old. And I can tell you that when I was a kid growing up, you probably would find me outside. Uh, basketball, soccer, softball, but my biggest thing was tennis. I'd be out on the tennis court early in the morning. I'd stay until the lights came on at night and I kept staying until the lights went off. Now my accent comes back every so often, okay? Like when the Eagles were in the Super Bowl, it was heavy, okay? When I head back and visit with my family in New Jersey, it takes me a little time for it to rub back off when I, when I get back. And certainly when I have a good piece of pizza, what we call tomato pie back at home, then my accent lights up a little bit. So as I said, uh, I've been in Colorado for a little over 20 years, and I live very close to Discovery Canyon uh, within Academy District 20, where my son, he's nine years old, uh, he's a third grader. My son Holden, you can see him on some of the pictures up there. Well, he's just my everything. Uh, he's the greatest gift of my life, past, present, future. If you were to come to my home, you'd see myself and my Holden there, of course. You'd see my mom, Barbara, and our dog, our lab, Barkley. And if you take a look at that picture in the upper right-hand corner, you'll see my mom on the left, my Holden and I in the middle, and you see my Aunt Nina and my Uncle John. They live in New Jersey. Now, I'm so fortunate because my mom has been a rock for me in my entire life. But I have a second mom in my Aunt Nina. 
And in my heart, my Uncle John is my dad. This, what you see on this slide, this is my focus outside of work. This is where I put my love and my attention. Now let's talk a little bit about my professional family. It's Academy District 20. Not everyone is as lucky as I am to find your professional home so early in your career. I was a high school math teacher at Lewis Palmer, and I came to serve as the Dean of Students, Pine Creek High School. And now you blink, and 17 years later, this is my 17th year, it's just hard to believe. I went on to be a teacher on special assignment, assistant principal and principal at Discovery Canyon Middle School, director and executive director in learning services where I had the utmost fortune to supervise principals at both the elementary and middle school level, and now the CFO. Now I talked about my family and they are my focus outside of work. What about at work? What's my focus? My biggest focus is making sure that our departments and schools have the resources they need to give the best educational experiences for our staff. I spend a lot of time looking at salaries and benefits and health insurance so that we can create the best opportunities for the best staff to attract and retain the best staff in the state of Colorado. I empower people to use their talents to do their work, to own the work tasks that they have, to believe in themselves. I believe in them, I give them the support they need to be successful. But I lead from a continuum of autonomy. And sometimes I'm on that part of high autonomy for those that I work with, because they're humming and things are going great. But sometimes we have some challenging tasks ahead. Sometimes they're what I call a Richter scale kind of issue, because it has some waves and some impacts on our community. When we're working through complex issues like that, I slide a little away from high autonomy and I'm more in that collaborative mode where we're looking for not only my input, but the input of others to make the best decisions that we can. Also, another focus area for me at work is trusting relationships. I am so fortunate I can walk into any school, I can walk into any department, I can walk into any stakeholder meeting and I know people. And more importantly, they know me. They know I love District 20, they know I care about them, and they know I care about their needs. So why do I wanna serve as your superintendent? Because I adore District 20 and the people who make it up. I believe with all my heart in the mission that we educate and inspire our students to thrive. I have educational, operational, and educational leadership experience, and it is with all humility that I tell you I can hit the ground running on July 1 to leverage the strengths that we have in District 20, to tackle the obstacles that we have before us, to help us remain the best school district in the state of Colorado, and help lift us to even greater heights. But what would that look like? What does my leadership look like? First for me, people come first always. I'm honest, visible, kind, and approachable. I have empathy for people. I know when they're struggling with their work and I know when they're struggling as people and I take the time to ask them, are you okay? Is there something I can do to help you? Because I care about people and value them. I'm not in my office much. I'm out more than I'm in, because I like to be where the action is, out where people are, listening, talking, collaborating, problem solving, taking the pulse of what's going well and what's not going well, so we can try to fix it. I can tell you that I value everyone's ideas. My title might be longer than other people's titles. Doesn't matter. I'm a regular person. I'm no better than anyone else. My idea doesn't mean it's the best idea. Everyone's ideas count, and that's where we're gonna get the best decisions for our community. I can tell you that I can find common ground, even when people have differing opinions. You know why? Because all of us want what's best for kids. And I can tell you I treat others the way I would wanna be treated on my toughest day. I do not give up. 
This is a picture of me in my basement at home where we have a picture of the movie poster for Rudy. I love that movie. I've seen it, I don't know, 40, 50 times. The story is about Rudy Rudiger, a young man who wants nothing more for his dream to run out on that field at Notre Dame as a football player. But I tell you what, he struggles in school. He doesn't have any money. He's not a natural athlete, but he does not give up. And one day he runs out of that tunnel onto that field. But before that, there's a part in the movie where he's out on the field because he used to help the players get ready. He was part of the prep team and he made a killer tackle. And that player got up and came over and pushed Rudy and said, what is this, a Super Bowl? The coach went over to that player and said, you just summed up your sorry career right then. Had you had half the heart of Rudiger, you could have been all American. I will tell you that for me, every day is Super Bowl Sunday. I don't know how to do anything different. And that's what people deserve of me. Our kids, our parents, our staff, our Board of Education, our community. They deserve nothing less than my best every day. People know my word is good. I say I'm going to do something, I, I do it. I'm a glass half full kind of lady. I see hope and optimism in the future. And when people are struggling to see that, they're down, they feel defeated, frustrated, tired, like so many of us, our staff have done in the last several years, I help pick people up. I remind us of why we do what we do and that I care about them. And we keep walking forward together. And I can tell you, I don't give up. I get a lot of people, especially when you handle the money, asking you for things. But I'll tell you, I have to say no. But I always say no. But how about, have, let's, have you tried? People know that the final answer may be no. But I gave it my best before we got to that point. Now let's talk about what's best for kids. What's best for kids, all kids. All kids are our kids. And what we do every day is we do the best we can to help our students build the knowledge, skills, and character they need to be successful. But we do not stop there. We look at the whole child. We look at social emotional health. We look at interpersonal skills. We try to ignite passions in kids for athletics and the arts and other extracurriculars and construction and auto so that our kids want to be here, feel successful and feel connected. When I make decisions, we make a lot of decisions. I look through this lens, what's best for kids. Now, I've shared with you a little bit about myself. I've shared why I would like to serve as your superintendent. I've shared what my leadership would look like. Now, I'm gonna talk about baseball cards. Here's why. So when I was a kid in New Jersey, um, Eric, my cousin, we used to spend a lot of time with baseball cards. We'd walk to the deli, buy baseball cards, very excited. We were Yankee fans, and uh, this is a, the back of a baseball card for Don Mattingly. He was a very popular player during the 80s and 90s, a first baseman for Yankees. And you can look on this card, and this has a lot of good information, because when you get these cards, you decide, do I want to trade it or keep it? And you can see at-bats and home runs and all of that. But you know what lesson I learned when I was a kid? The power in this card comes when you look at the front. Because people are the heart of our success. And here in Academy District 20, we have so many skilled staff who use so much information and insight, everything from student academic growth data to achievement data, to school performance framework, district performance framework, enrollment data, capacity data, how did we spend a $600 million budget data? But you know, when we use that information, we make good decisions for our students. But I wanna make great decisions for our students. And to do that, we've got to look like we do with that baseball card and picture that student, picture that staff member, picture that parent, that community member. Picture the collective faces of District 20. That is gonna get us to the point where we are setting the best decisions we can for our community and help our kids reach 
on limitless potential. Thank you so much. This is a highlight of my entire career in District 20. And I just want to thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Ms. Allen. Our next candidate up is Mr. Brett Smith. Brett, the podium is yours. Thank you. I don't know how to follow the Don Mattingly reference other than to say, Becky, I have a Bill Buckner 1986 World Series card that I'd be happy to trade for with you. Thank you for the opportunity and good evening to everyone. My name is Brett Smith and I'm the Chief Operating Officer for Academy District 20. Why do I want to be the leader of Academy District 20, you may ask? The short answer is I love District 20. The people, the expectations, the excellence, and the challenge to be the best. My desire to lead District 20 stems from my fundamental core belief of pursuing excellence. As quality leadership is the defining characteristic of any successful organization, I seek to lead this organization. I joined District 20 15 years ago when I accepted the principalship at Timberview Middle School. Whereas there were many opportunities for principal positions throughout the region, I only submitted one application that year. Sorry, I'm getting used to the slides. The reputation of excellence in Academy District 20 was what attracted me. I wanted the challenge of accountability of leading a school where I would be measured against the best leaders in a district with the highest expectations. I quickly learned that the reputation of District 20 attracts the best and the brightest, but it is the climate and culture that keeps those people here. I also learned that the expectation of high academic achievement and growth is balanced by a commitment to innovative educational programming, support, and extracurricular activities for all students. The art of teaching, that is the professional practices teachers must master for licensure, has changed very little over time. What has changed is the trust, respect, and confidence of our professionals and our profession. Many of the disruptions to the educational environment are driven by external factors that are far from the classroom and detract from the environment focused on teaching and learning. The current context of public education profession requires a leader with the convictions to balance expectations with the trust and confidence of parents in a healthy climate and culture for all students and staff. I believe that my leadership strengths and experience can bring balance to the distractions, disruptions, divisiveness, and dysfunction in our profession by focusing on students, cultivating trusting relationships, valuing our differences, and rather than seeking only my way or your way, we, we seek the third way. Thank you, Allison, for Cortez for that uh, reference. The key to success in Academy District 20, being accredited with distinction for more than a decade, is the teachers, the staff, and the administrators who demonstrate professionalism, competence, and commitment to students every day. The challenge is not to become complacent. I have 15 years of experience in the district, and in every one of those years, I have challenged my staff to set achievable goals, model high standards, and be accountable for results, both good and bad. A site-based leadership philosophy in the district allowed me, for lack of a better term, to be the mayor of my own Timberview town. We collaborated as professionals, partnered with parents, and built systems to support all students and provide a meaningful middle school experience. If there was a maverick principal with a vision for success, improvement, and truly leaving no child behind, it was me. To be clear, District 20 is not broken. In fact, 
One of the compelling reasons for my desire to lead the district is the excitement I have for innovation, creativity, and a continued focus on student academic achievement and growth with it within a culture that meets the needs of all students. My understanding of the current strengths, constraints, and future needs of the district provides for an immediate focus on the sustainment of excellence and the systemic improvements necessary to meet the needs of students, staff, and the community now and in the future. Why is my leadership good for District 20? I'm a well-respected leader within the district and I have earned the trust and confidence of staff at all levels. In fact, aside from my commitment to lead District 20, I am here tonight because of staff and community members who encouraged me to seek the position of superintendent. Their trust and confidence is not lost on me. It is both humbling and an honor to stand before you. My application for the position of superintendent for Academy District 20 is not driven by title or position, but rather from my core belief, my calling to lead the district, and my commitment to the students, staff, parents, and the community of District 20. To know me, it is necessary to know where I come from. The foundation for my leadership values is the result of a decorated and distinguished 20-year military career. I joined the Army straight out of high school. I think it was during the Who Shot JR Dallas episode that I saw the commercial, Be All That You Can Be. And I told my mom, I want to be all that I can be in Europe. So off to Germany I went. When I was 23 years old, I was put in charge of a squad of young soldiers. I would learn later that the literary term for this is foreshadowing, as it was a lot like being a middle school teacher. The Army afforded me a lifelong education into effective leadership, tactical and strategic decision making, and how to take care of people to accomplish more collectively than individually. My pursuit of excellence early in my military career led me to complete the Special Forces Qualification course where I earned my Green Beret. The picture at the bottom right corner was taken shortly after we arrived in Colorado Springs at Vinatucci Pumpkin Farm. It is my favorite picture in uniform as it is with our daughter on a school field trip, which I rarely was able to attend. She remains one of my greatest influences and I'm so proud of her as throughout all of her schooling years, she was going to be a teacher. Now she says I stole that idea from her. The leadership attributes that I developed as a soldier and live every day have made me the leader I am. When I transitioned from the military, I found those same attributes increased leadership effectiveness and had a positive impact on organizational excellence. Perhaps my greatest accomplishment was marrying my wife. Together we, okay, mostly her, raised five incredible kids. At O Dark 30, that's a technical military term for it's dark as heck out there, on the back of a helicopter in the middle of nowhere in 1999, I defined the perfect post-military retirement job, middle school principal. When I told my wife I wanted to retire from the military and be a middle school principal, she asked if I fell on my head in my last parachute jump. Now, if you bear with me, it's not by happenstance that I chose middle school. Growing up, I was a free range kid and I went to seven elementary schools and five high schools, but only one middle school. That middle, that middle school was Black Mountain Middle School. It was the foundation for all of the success that I have enjoyed in life. The person in the bottom right hand corner there is Miss Gallion. She was my eighth grade teacher. And that's on a visit she made to Timberview Middle School to meet my staff and hang out for a day and I'm sure tell untruths about me to the entire staff. But it was the culmination of what I had done in my second career that made me feel like she had built the success in me that had come full circle in my life. Now, I like to say my greatest accomplishment as a professional may be going from special forces to special education. When I joined the teaching profession, I found there was no easy pathway to go from soldier to principal. 
So I took a course called the Intro to Special Education at UCCS and I was hooked. It had me. I have served as a special education teacher and administrator throughout my career. In fact, it was a duty I loved to have even as principal at Timberview Middle School was being the special education administrator. Everything I ever learned about leadership and needed to know I learned as a middle school principal, that is a fact. Remember, this was my dream job and the goal when I came into education. Now, I'd be remiss if I didn't recognize the staff of that fabulous school. In 2019, we were awarded a John Irwin School of Excellence, and it is not for anything that I did on my own. That was an incredible staff of professionals who came together collectively and would not let kids fail. What is very impressive about this is our school was over 1,200 students that year. Statistically, that's very difficult to get a John Irwin School of Excellence award that I'm sure we would have continued had some little thing called COVID not gotten our way. Now, the absolute goal of every leader who is effective is to grow more leaders. In this picture, you will see former assistant principals of Timberview Middle School who lead schools throughout our district and in other places, directors. There are pictures of teachers who worked under me who are now assistant principals. You may recognize Tom Andrew, Debbie Holt, Gina Perez, for you old timers. That's Russ Peters down there. He's a principal in Washington. You might recognize Molly Reagan, Annette Zook, and Chris Newman as fabulous administrators that are serving our district. Every leader knows when it's time to go and mine came after 13 years. I am now the chief operating officer. I've been in the job a little more than a year and a half. And in that time, we have consolidated the security departments, facilities, transportation, risk management, food service, and crisis management under one department. I will tell you this, we're more effective, we are more efficient, and we are safer not because of anything that I have done directly, but it's because of the incredible directors that lead their departments. They are leaders in their own right, and they're gosh darn good at their jobs. These are my leadership core values. Number one, lead from the front. Number two, demand accountability. Set high expectations. Trust your instincts. Take care of your people. These are my commitments to District 20. Do what is right. Lead with courage and conviction. Be accountable. Student outcomes are our mission. A high quality staff is essential. The bottom line is I look a lot like each of you. I'm a spouse, a parent, a best friend, a coach, a professional, a veteran, and a neighbor. I too have become frustrated with the culture wars and politics in the boardroom that have created unnecessary stress in classrooms and schools in our community. And I worry about the country that I have served and bled for. My promise to you is to be assess accessible, transparent, model the highest ethical and professional standards, and know this, we can solve any problem and overcome any obstacle by working together and continuing to focus on meeting the needs of all students. And I'd like to take just a moment and tell a story that I told last night. And I'll tell it tonight because I don't want to leave uh, that story told in one venue and not another venue. But I met Chase, a young student at Timberview when he came as a young sixth grader. Chase was one of the most unique learners I have ever met in my life. And on that day, on that first meeting, as his mom brought him into the school, and he met me, he was a little dysregulated. That happens when people meet me for the first time. Long hair, facial hair. I guess I must have set him off, and onto the floor he went. Laying on the floor, throwing fit. Mom was not embarrassed. Mom was absolutely used to this. She was telling us, this is Chase. And if I knew how he would turn out, I would have named him Sit Still. But that was Chase as we met him. And what I did was got down on the floor and went head to head with him and we had a great conversation. Actually, we had a one-way conversation. He was nonverbal, so I talked my, like I always do. It was a good chance for me to take a nap, relax a little right there in the foyer. 
And that relationship was strong, not only with Chase, but with his mother. And I will tell you this, that thought, that story is never far from my mind as I wander through the district, whether I am with Heather out reading stories at Doug Valley, whether I'm with Will over Pioneer watching incredible performances, okay? I'm not far from kids. And if that very thing happened today, my actions would be the very same as a superintendent of schools, because this is about kids, not some kids, not those kids, it's about all kids. I thank you for the opportunity. It's been a pleasure to speak with you. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Our third candidate this evening is Dr. Bill Sievers. Bill, the podium is yours. Good evening. First of all, my name is Bill Sievers. Uh, I always like to see in the audience of who's in the audience. I did this last night and it's always great to kind of get a feel of who's here. So if you're a student, if you can just raise your hand and we can see if any students are here tonight. Great, there are no students in the audience compared to last night. Uh, how about parents? Great, thank you. Staff members? Awesome, Bit business, business or community members? And then how about military families? All right, thank you. Uh, gra grandparents, thank you. Gra grandparents, awesome. <laughs> thank you everybody for coming out tonight. Uh, I, I just have to say, wow, uh, what what a great, great district. Uh, today I had an opportunity to get out to schools, talk talk to principals. You know, I won't tell you the schools to, to put principals on the spot, but uh, j just listening to them and really hearing what their advice is. Like I always ask the question of what advice do you have for me and, and how forthright people were to give me advice. Uh, the best advice I got today was to be myself. So. Tonight will be about myself. Uh, the other thing is thank you to the viewers tonight uh, that are viewing. I think there was 57 that are viewing tonight. And then uh, thank you to the Thompson School District employees that are watching tonight, hoping that my presentation doesn't go well. So, so that's just some humor of people watching tonight. Uh, before I begin, compared to last night's presentation is a little different because of the audience here. Uh, I had an opportunity to talk to uh, Mr. Gregory and what, what a great superintendent that this academy uh, D, D20 has had. So just a, a quick moment of thank you for everything he's done and his retirement and what he's given to the district for 32 years has, has been pretty amazing. So that, that's kind of different than the presentation last night. Uh, the task was, because I'm really task orientated, so looking at the task, the task was, and I, great, I got great feedback last night and People correct me said it's not Academy 20, it's Academy District 20 or D20. So <laughs> that was always great feedback. But the task is, why, why did I choose Academy District 20 and why is your leadership a good fit for Academy District 20? So the thing I'd start off with is there's a story. Like everybody in here has a story, everybody at home has a story, board members have a story, staff members have a story. So the theme that I have is the story. So the first story that I start off with is is a story about a Academy District 20. So it's accredited with distinction and, and just thinking there's a story behind that achievement. There's a lot of work that goes behind that. And for me, when I think about the story is if you think about yourself as a circle and a dot within that circle, there's so much to you to fill up that circle and it's a responsibility of a strong leader to really find out who, who people are because it's all about relationships. And that's what another principal told me today about advice is it's all about relationships and getting to know people. So for me to hear that and talk to people, that that's the type of person that I am, is really about building relationships. The years I've spent in human resources, it, it's all about human capital, and, and that's what it is about re relationships and getting to know people. So, so the mission really stands out to me, the mission of we educate and inspire students to thrive, amazing. The all students graduation rate of 93.7%, there, there's a story behind that. 
the work that goes on to to accomplish something like that is is really what I've been finding out more and more. So the Academy District 20, and you see that error that's in my presentation. Uh, thank you for the correction. Uh, you know, there's a belief statement. So the story is believe people are the heart of success. That's something that calls to me. Uh, this is the first superintendent position that I've applied for because of these values. So for me, I'm not looking to be a superintendent at any district. I'm looking to be the next superintendent of this district. So uh, believing in relationships matter. It's all about relationships, and I continue to say that. And I believe in a quality education. All right, so <clears throat> you can't see that as well. But last Saturday, I had an opportunity to come out and uh, hang out at Starbucks. So there's a picture of the Starbucks that I hung out at. Uh, and the rules I gave myself is whoever comes in and wants to talk to me, like if I approach them and they talk to me, I'm just going to take the feedback from them and just write whatever feedback they give me. So I had talked to two students. So the first student, you know, I asked the question about the highlights of, of high school and the highlights of the district. And Savannah, she graduated from Pine Creek. And the highlight is she really loved being social with friends. Well, what high school student doesn't believe in that, being social with friends? Fun school activities. There are a lot of resources, so huge kudos to all the counselors out there that support students. So she, she had mentioned counselors and then help to be college and career ready. So for me to hear a student talk about being college and career ready is, is pretty a huge, huge, huge accomplishment there. And then she's working two jobs to save for college. And then the same thing when I talk to people, you know, I always love to learn from people and give advice. So I asked her, so what advice do you have for me? And she said, call more snow days. Remember students live in the forest. So <laughs> I was like, that's great advice. Yeah, so uh, that was awesome. And then the other thing she said, try and try to be involved by connecting with students. So she thought it was honorable for me to kind of talk to her about that. But, but it's pretty important to understand that part about the advice, try to be involved by connecting with students. And as long as I've been in education for 25 years around students, it's all about students. So getting to know them, getting to know what their aspirations are and getting to know what their dreams are is what being an educator is all about. OK, the next student that I talked to was Caitlin. She graduated from the village. The highlight were teachers. She said it was a hard stage of her life. So is there anyone else in here that had a hard time in high school, a hard stage in life? Like you can raise your hand or you can just hide. You know. <clears throat> so I agree with Caitlin. I, I said, yes, I totally agree with high school being, but she loved the teachers. So that's twice she talked about teachers in the conversation I had with her, just loving the teachers. And, and that's what a community is all about. That's what a district is all about. People and, and teachers are people. Uh, and then some kids were mean. The part she said, there were some mean girls that, that were there. So. I said I would write everything down there. And then the advice, make students feel connected like you understand them. So that's two high school students that are graduating that, that said like there's a kind of connection, like get to know me as a student. So I thought that was pretty awesome. And then I was waiting for a parent to finish eating before I trounced over there. So I just snuck over there a little bit and uh, he didn't give me his name. So I introduced myself and when I introduced myself, he had two kids in the district, but when I introduced myself and I said, I'm a finalist for the superintendent position, he said he wanted to stay out of it. So it was great feedback. Like I didn't ask any questions like, okay, so can you tell me more? Like, what does that mean to stay out of it? But I said, thank you so much for your time. And I just kind of went back to my table and he didn't give me any eye contact after that. So that was a great sign for me to, okay, okay, I'm done with that. And then I had talked to an employee at a recent job fair for us recruiting employees. Uh, the employee said there's a sense of strong community and parent involvement and pride. And, and I'll tell you, the people I've talked to today, there's just this great sense of pride within, within this district, which is amazing, which draws to me. So that's one of the tasks of why, why did I apply for this position? And then the other task was le leadership styles. So there's two leadership styles that I really resonate with is a servant leader. You know, I'm, I'm focused on the needs of others before I consider my own needs. Um, we kind of learned that through COVID a little bit. At times you're thinking about 
you know, how it impacted you, but how did it impact others too? And the other thing that's huge with me is create a culture of trust. You know, there's different facets of trust. And, and, and for me to create a culture around that is, is extremely important. And then inspire vision. It's all about a vision. You can have a vision, but if you don't bring people along with you in the vision, then, then there is no vision. And then uh, the most important thing about being a server leader is empowering others. Okay, it looks like I have five minutes left. This is going pretty fast. The other one is leadership style. There are times people don't want to talk about being a transformational leader, but it's important to understand what transformational leadership is all about. So finding innovative ways to stay ahead of the curve, inspiring others, and once again, inspiring others is something that's important to me. And courageous decisions, as long as I've been in HR and a leader for 16 years, like it's all about courageous decisions. And then professional values, and I'll try to go through this a little fast with a few minutes left here. Build, building relationships is, is critical for me. Each student can learn and succeed in the right learning environment. And, and that that is so true when I, I have to tell you, I, 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 I visited the village today, and that's extremely true with, with the learning setting there. And then parents are their children's most important teacher, me being a parent as well. You know, that's extremely important. And then continuous improvement. You know, I talk to people all about this, being better than the day before, you know, especially being a coach as well. And then here's my professional story. So after graduating high school, I enlisted in four years in the United States Air Force. Uh, during basic training is when Persian Gulf War started. So being an 18 year old uh, during wartime, uh, that kind of shaped, shaped you a little different. I was stationed at, uh, my tech school was at Lowry Air Force Base. Uh, and then I was stationed at Luke Air Force Base. I work on an F-15 weapon system. And that, that was really exciting. The first summer in Arizona, it was 122 degrees. So going from Colorado, where there was still snow, and then to Arizona, I was like, wow, man, this is great. And I graduated from Arizona State, and I'm a Sun Devil. Uh, U of A lost today, so I'm kind of excited about that. I apologize. I, I apologize, but being a Sun Devil, I have to say that. And then I'm a lumberjack. Northern Arizona University was my master's. I became a math teacher. I moved to Colorado. I taught middle school math. And then I became a dean of students, uh, assistant principal for two years. I was appointed the principal at uh, birth, uh, Turner Middle School and birthed it. And I graduated from CSU with a PhD, and my dissertation was focused on the relationship between math anxiety and student achievement. And I can talk to you hours about that at a, another time. Professional story continued. Thompson School District, I've been there 22 years, 25 years overall in education. The district is 16,000 students, over 30 schools. Last night I said 300 schools. I, I had an extra zero in there and I was like, 300 schools? This district is no problem if I manage 300 schools like that. And then we have 2,200 employees. We're the 17th largest in Colorado. I'm currently the Chief Human Resources Officer. I've been in that position for the last nine years. Uh, I'm responsible for, ev for everything. There, there's just so much. I'm the acting superintendent when our superintendent is out of the district or out of town. I'm, I'm responsible for benefits and risk management, professional development, lead negotiating, 1338, educator effectiveness, staffing, attract, retain, and develop, and labor laws. And I can give you examples for everything, but for time purposes. And then personal story, I grew up in Gary, Indiana. Is anyone in the audience from Gary, Indiana? I survived if you're not familiar with Gary. Uh, I annoyed my sisters being the youngest of three. So the pictures, there, there's a picture of me coaching, like I love coaching. Um, uh, my youngest son, he's at ASU right now, so I'm, I'm, I'm proud. You know, it's always fun to say, hi, son, devil. So being a son, devil. I've, I've been married 27 years, and I have, my oldest son is 23. He's a baseball player at Clark University. And then I coach wrestling, basketball, cross country. My wife, I've been married 27 years, wearing our son, devil gear at the game. And she was totally excited because I put the dog in there too, because he's part of the family as well. He's a three, three, three and a half pound uh, barking. I love him so much. Tea, teacup Pomeranian. And then closing story with a minute. So I'm, I'm really about doing and not so much about talking all the time. So I just want to finish with a former student testimony that I'd like to read. So this student dropped off a letter to me at the district office. Right, she just dropped it off and left. And, and, and here's, here's what she wrote to me, and I'm not much of a crier, but at the time when I got the letter, 
you know, you realize what kind of impact an, ed an educator can make. And this is what the letter said. Uh, she said, hello, Dr. Sievers. I wanted to write this letter to thank you for all that you did for me as a student. I had you as a teacher at Walt Clark Middle School. I had you for eighth grade math. I was in your class from, I won't tell you the years, many moons ago. School was always very difficult for me. I spent a lot of time in school feeling very unseen or in some cases too seen. I struggled to find my place and where I fit in. Math was always my worst subject and I felt like it was always an impossible journey. However, however, from the first day I stepped in your class, you made me feel seen and that it was okay to be who I was. There are many times where I would ask questions and students would make fun of me. However, you were swift to correct it and I will never forget how that made me feel. It allowed me to push myself to ask questions and also not be afraid to learn even though it may be uncomfortable. I took from that experience strength, courage, and advocacy. I've learned how to learn and ask questions regardless if it pushes me to my, com my comfort zone. I have never forgotten what you had done for me that year. Last week, I graduated with a Master's of Arts in Counseling. I work as a case manager for the second largest Social Security approved employment network in the United States. I assist people with disabilities obtain and maintain employment. I wanna thank you for all that you have done for me in my life. And, and that sums up the, the personality that I have as a teacher and, and a leader and hopefully the next superintendent of D20. Thank you. Our final candidate this evening is Mrs. Ginger Haberer. Uh, Ms. Haberer, the podium is yours. Well, thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, I'm very excited about the prospect of being your next superintendent, and I believe that I'm a good fit on both a personal and professional level. I chose to apply to Academy 20 for multiple reasons. Uh, certainly over a decade, Academy District 20 has had the wonderful accreditation of distinction. It's truly a legacy of excellence. Uh, we have the presence of the Air Force Academy here. Uh, you promote expanded learning opportunities and I was out in schools as well today and it was just amazing uh, what's being done in our schools here. Uh, I, uh, have a, I know that you have a very dedicated staff with extensive years of experience and certainly a willingness to go to great lengths as evidenced by the all district choir to really come together and build that sense of family. I think that is just really amazing. On a personal level, I think I'm a good fit. I'm a native of Colorado. I spent time growing up in Southwest Denver. Uh, my family and my husband's family live along the Front Range. I love outdoor activities and would love to explore the Colorado Springs area. I had come from a family tree of teachers and they really instilled in me the importance of academic excellence and really inspiring uh, the joy of uh, promoting creativity, a growth mindset, and just really being lifelong learners. And those are my whys for being an educator. Uh, I, uh, my son, uh, was also, uh, when he was younger, was in the uh, Civil Air Patrol and where he did a week of encampment. And I just really appreciated uh, the values that he learned there uh, around integrity first, service before self, and excellence in all that we do. I'm also a wife and a mother. I have two sons and I just really, another thing that really drew me to Academy 20 is you have a real value for parent choice and voice. And as a parent, uh, those are important values to me as well. Uh, personal and professional community involvement is really important to me. Uh, and some examples of that are marching in the Ellensburg Annual Rodeo Parade and uh, singing in the Valley Voices Community Choir. Uh, and certainly here in Academy 20, I would also be very involved in the community. I also sit on four community boards uh, and involved in several different uh, communities, uh, committees. And uh, really the networking with these different entities has really provided more opportunities for grants and programming in the district as a whole. 
Uh, I know that Academy 20 really has a laser-like focus on academic achievement, and I believe that the uh, styles of my leadership really align with Academy 20. Uh, I am definitely uh, am a strategic and uh, very uh, forward-thinking and visionary, and most importantly, I put the needs of students first. They are always at the forefront uh, when in my decision-making. So as you can see, uh, I, one of my greatest strengths is instructional leadership. Uh, I have multiple years as a secondary, uh, sci mainly science teacher, earning national board certification. I was an assistant uh, superintendent in uh, Poudre School District, and I'm going on five years as the superintendent in Ellensburg, and also spent multiple years as a middle school and a high school principal and a director of student achievement in Aurora Public Schools. I have multiple examples of how my commitment is really to building teams and empowering high performing teams. Uh, and uh, certainly uh, I, am, I have important strengths in strategic leadership, increasing career opportunities, uh, really strengthening those multi-tiered systems of support, uh, operational needs being very strong in both human resources and finance, uh, strategic planning, and uh, certainly creating cultures of connectedness. And that's really one of my passions. I have a model that I follow for strategic planning and uh, that model has served me well in really embedding the board ends into the different uh, cultures of both especially Poudre School District and Allensburg. Another strength of my leadership is really building strong partnerships with community colleges and uh, universities, and you can see the different universities and colleges that I've worked with. Uh, certainly when I was in Poudre School District, I worked uh, hard with uh, Front Range Community College, Ames Community College, CSU, uh, to put together uh, uh, more opportunities for dual credit uh, and increasing the number of students in the Ascent program. I also partnered with Larimer County Workforce Development, and we were able to get CNA certifications in Columbia Health uh, with Columbia Healthcare and definitely promoted more internships with businesses, including uh, uh, Woodward Governor. And um, really, it was exciting. We uh, I had amazing departments that I worked with in Poudre, and we came together and developed a, uh, a, tr a district dashboard where it really helped us to track students who were, um, what the academic progress was of them, but well, most importantly, uh, knowing what students were on track to graduate. And the principals really appreciated that because that really gave them an opportunity uh, to intervene, intervene early and often so that, and as a matter of fact, uh, and uh, within a two year time period, we significantly working all together as a team were able to raise graduation rates. last night too. I used to be used to that altitude, but I think it's kind of getting to me this time. So some of the innovative approaches that um, I have used is um, in Poudre, uh, I uh, was uh, led a field trip to or to uh, California to look at the linked learning exploration model, which resulted in Poudre High School uh, implementing wall-to-wall -wall career pathways for all students starting with the freshman class. And I also helped to establish externships for teachers, uh, where teachers uh, pay, were paid to spend several days in businesses shadowing different career pathways so that they could really understand what are those soft skills that our students need in order to succeed uh, as employees. And in Poudre, or in uh, Ellensburg, I initiated a partnership with Habitat for Humanity, uh, where we, our students, are uh, very busily building sheds for a new uh, housing development that is being uh, built. Um, other, uh, other evidence of my strategic and systemic approach to leadership include really building strong MTSS, multi-tiered systems of support for students. And it's, uh, it's really important, I think, to use this system in responding to both behavioral and uh, instructional needs of students. And I, uh, an MTSS team is just simply a team of building or district level teams that get together and meet regularly to uh, look at data, to know what the needs of students are and to implement them. 
And I have a lot of experience in that and would look forward to working alongside principals and teachers to strengthen those MTSS uh, processes here in Academy 20. Uh, academic supports, most importantly, uh, are really associated with professional learning communities. And I have a lot of expertise in this area. Uh, and uh, certainly uh, research shows that strong PLCs have one of the highest impacts on student achievement. So when I was in Aurora Public Schools as both a middle school and a high school principal, I worked really hard in strengthening these PLCs. And I believe they had a positive impact on increasing ACT scores, uh, especially at Hinkley High School. Uh, as well as uh, helping with graduation rates. And most importantly, really, we had more students that shifted into our international baccalaureate or IB programs at both the middle school and the high school level. I also uh, take a very uh, visionary approach to leadership. And uh, early learning is something that is really important. Uh, and um, certainly, uh, I would work hard to make sure that we have a strong early learning program here. And I led efforts uh, in early learning to put like what I need uh, opportunities in place where students actually get to meet in smaller groups uh, uh, to get their needs met. I'm also very much a proponent of STEM uh, opportunities and project-based learning and have multiple examples there in uh, Aurora, Poudre, and Ellensburg of how I've promoted those opportunities. And um, certainly that would be something that I would do. And we even imp implemented uh, STEM into our early learning program uh, as part of, um, we call it STREAM. We do that in the libraries as well as in our early learning center where we tie uh, science projects and art projects to books that students are reading even at an early age. And there you can see a student sitting under a tree and there's an example of stream. It's a library specialist rotation. Uh, students had a chance to read about forests and do a little science experiment or about why leaves turn colors. And then they had a chance to go and sit under a tree and actually do some art. And our students and teachers have really loved it. Uh, on the other side of that triangle, uh, there's academic levels of support, but there's also behavioral levels of support. And uh, in Pooter, I led efforts to build a feeder system of support with mental health specialists and our uh, special education and counselors uh, across feeder teams so that we had greater communication across that feeder team so we could better serve our students. And, and certainly in uh, Pooter uh, and uh, all of those districts, I really led efforts to put in place uh, community circles uh, that have uh, really helped to give every student a voice uh, and uh, that and also really strengthen those MTSS uh, structures so that we are really disaggregating the data and making sure that our students in special education, our English language learners and our uh, gifted and talented students are really accelerating in their academic achievement and having the support that they need with behavior. Uh, I noticed on the survey that one of the objectives was to potentially uh, pass a uh, mill levy override, and I have very successful experience with that in both Pooter and uh, Ellensburg. Uh, an example of one of the posters we used recently in February of 2022, we passed two levies, a six-year uh, tech levy and a four-year EP&O levy. So I definitely have different strategies that I've used that have been really successful. Uh, and so I look forward to leading those efforts as your superintendent. I definitely have operational leadership with finance. Uh, I meet regularly with the cabinet and uh, with our executive director of finance and together we make good decisions uh, and really make sure that the uh, district stays financially stable and legislative uh, advocacy is really important. And there I am in the upper corner uh, with the president of our teachers association, uh, one of our board members and a dean of students with Senator Wilson at Olympia at the Capitol. I also have operational leadership with human resources and would work closely with uh, that department here to uh, hire and retain quality staff. Uh, visionary leadership, I really believe it's important to create connectedness uh, and uh, have created multiple venues for celebration. I think it's important to look at the needs of our military children and families, uh, elevating student voice, and I have some examples of that. 
and certainly empowering parent voice and partnerships through committees as well as informal coffees. Uh, one of the successes that I'm most proud of and excited about is the opening. Uh, we passed a, a multi-million dollar bond project and it resulted in the building of two brand new elementaries and a remodel of a third. And all of those projects were finished on time and within budget. And it was very exciting. Our brand new school we named after Ida Nace and Aronica. Ida was a uh, very much a, a Native American leader in the Kittitas Valley. And the celebration was really moving. Uh, we had uh, Native American representatives from across Washington come, as well as other stakeholders. And it was really a time to bring all of those stakeholders together uh, for a celebration. And the other uh, celebration for me was uh, really hosting the first Belonging in the Berg, a world cafe. Uh, one of my passions is uh, being involved in the community and bringing stakeholders together around that common vision uh, that we all want our students to succeed. And so this one was around belonging. Uh, we had over 75 community members there on a Saturday afternoon, uh, and we got uh, great feedback on that, and uh, we are going to do that again uh, in the uh, spring. And again, it was a partnership with the city of Allensburg and Central Washington University. And I'm always looking for ways to make connections with our community partners because together we really are better. And so um, I, again, appreciate the opportunity to be here and to apply for this position. Uh, I, my promises to you would be that I would be accessible and I would be an active listener. And I would say uh, to everybody uh, that I would meet what do you need from me in order for you to do your very best work? Uh, I would also uh, really uh, look at uh, how do we stay uh, forward thinking with our, our district? Uh, what are those changes that are coming up? What are the changes, the shifts in demographics? What is the growth in population? And how do we stay ahead of the curve? I'm very responsive and I'm very proactive in my leadership and would really look forward to working together with the board and the community and our staff uh, to stay ahead. And uh, the most exciting thing I think is just to continue to bring us together. And my job would be to inspire our staff uh, to really come together and be uh, a learning community as one big district, uh, because I really believe that that is the heart of the board and our staff and community members. And I honestly, I'm confident that uh, as your uh, superintendent, we would together really raise Academy 20 to that next level of excellence. And uh, I think the vision for that clearly rests on the superintendent. And that is a role that I would embrace and take accountability for and really see that vision as a reality. So thank you so much for this time. I'd like to give one final thanks to each of our four candidates. Um, as they wrap up this next to last uh, task in front of them. Um, we are going to exit. We're going to leave you this evening and uh, and get ready for uh, for tomorrow. We'll be here bright and early uh, uh, to kick that off. But I wanted to make sure if you had any last uh, questions or um, need for information from me before we convene in the morning, I wanted to make sure I gave you that opportunity before I leave and take candidates with me. We're good. OK, we will uh, see you bright and early in the morning then. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you, Dr. Cooper. It's a difficult job ahead of us. Next is Board Development District Accountability Committee Report of School Resource Priorities for the School Year 23-24. Mr. Gregory. Yes, Ms. Allen, please. And team. Good evening. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Ms. Amanda Martin. She served as our co-chair for our DAC budget subcommittee this year. And uh, so I'm going to turn it over to her and she's going to do a wonderful job sharing with you our DAC resource priorities for 23-24. And while she's coming up, I forgot to mention we peaked at 120 people listening online. So we went, we just steadily got higher and now we're starting to drop. All right, thanks Ms. Allen. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm happy about that. Um, so thank you all. I know it's a busy night, so thanks for giving me the time. Um, I am here because 
Colorado statute says the DAC should recommend to the board priorities for spending the school district's money. And so we met with all the principals in the district in feeder strands back in January. And we asked them on the ground, what are your spending priorities? What do you need to make our schools continue to be amazing? Um, I'm not gonna go over every bullet. And just so you know, the bullets are not in order of importance, okay? Um, we asked them to provide feedback on a bunch of questions. We asked them about their, the current situation in the schools, the learning gaps, the technology and digital resources that they need, social emotional learning, as well as needs related to the COVID, COVID pandemic. Then we asked them about their high priority capital needs. And when we get there, you'll see that was a big area of focus for our principals. And finally, we asked them about their future needs, the needs they think in three to five years will be here that aren't today. Um, and included in that are the um, needs that they anticipate when the ESSER funding ends in September of 24. So starting with learning gaps, uh, the principals identified uh, the need for identification of math and reading curriculums, and especially intervention resources. They talked a lot about the need for professional learning um, for, for our staff, as well as the need to maintain Title I uh, programming, staffing, despite a reduction in Title I dollars, and looking at lots of assessment tools to identify the skill deficits and to monitor student progress. When we asked them about uh, their priorities in technology and digital resources, they talked about the need for consistent replenishment of devices and maintenance of the current devices, not just the student laptops, but also the other technology in our schools, the printers, the projectors, those things. So the maintenance of those, as well as the need for development of one-to-one -one device plan for our K-2 students, and then bridging of our second graders on tablets up to third graders on laptops. When we talked to them about uh, their priorities in social emotional learning and the culture of belonging, they again mentioned the need for continued professional learning in the program that we have. There's a lot of uh, social emotional learning programming in our schools, just making sure that our staff are, um, are up to date on them and trained on them constantly. Um, a need for additional school counselor positions in our schools to reduce the counselor to student ratio. And uh, especially they mentioned the need for tools and strategies to identify students with social emotional learning needs. Next, we spoke to them about their high priority capital needs, and you'll see that we have two slides of answers from our principals. Um, that's something that they really emphasize. Um, we started out talking about the, the uh, asbestos abatement costs and um, their gratitude for the district of sharing those costs and the hope that that continues forward. And then the maintenance of the outsides of our buildings, our landscaping, our turf fields, our parking lots, the lighting in our parking lots for safety. Um, a dedicated and consistent funding streams going forward to address all the deferred maintenance at our older facilities. Um, we heard a lot from our principals as a high priority. And uh, our athletic fields, both our gems and our outdoor uh, fields as well. And then we heard from them about the need for our older facilities to be on par with our newly constructed facilities. So we got lots of examples, cafeterias, gems, pools, air conditioning, um, sound systems, lighting, furniture, flooring, bathrooms, um, a lot of needs in that area. Moving forward, uh, we ask our principals about needs that they have today that they didn't have three to five years ago. And they talked to us about the complexity of their safety and security challenges, about some staffing shortages, especially in special education, about the changing social emotional needs of students, and a high level of challenge that they called related to being a student, the act of coming to school every day.
They also talked about um, a reduction in Title I funding and how their intervention needs have remained the same and they're they're addressing those needs with with smaller dollar amounts and um, staff shortages and recruitment and retention. Then when we talk to them about future needs, things that they don't have today, but they see coming down the pipeline. Um, they talked about a um, the consideration of a variety of factors beyond just student enrollment numbers to determine levels of school funding. And I know we have a new school resource allocation committee coming on board to start addressing that. Um, we looked at how uh, they talked about how some of the areas of our district have declining eh, enrollment, while others have um, increasing enrollment and looking at some short term and long term facility planning in order to make sure that the offerings and some of our schools remain strong, that we have good marketing for them um, so that we can attract students to some of those amazing schools that currently have declining enrollment. We ask our principals about needs they see in their schools related to COVID. And they mentioned again their staffing shortages, especially in special education. And that higher level of challenge related to student behavior. And um, we heard a bunch about the need for measurement and remediation of learning loss and the recruitment and retention of high quality staff. Then we wanted to make sure that we had an understanding of of their needs um, related to the expiration of the ESSER funding. So um, the needs that they identified are uh, the ESSER funded progress monitoring tools, the ESSER funded school based school based tutoring programs that are in a bunch of our schools, um, the staffing for the academic interventions, the staffing supplies and operational costs for the Family Resource Center, and the fact that um, some of our ESSER funds have been filling in for reductions in Title I dollars and um, the need that that will cause. So that is all that I have for you tonight. If you have any questions for me or Ms. Allen. Mr. Temby. Uh, not, a, not an immediate question, but uh, just thanks, Amanda. Having served on both of these subcommittees, uh, it's extra time on top of DAC, which is uh, consumptive of time too. So thanks for your service. Um, from your vantage point, um, what were maybe a couple of your greatest takeaways from the entire exercise? Absolutely, thank you. Um, I think you guys have amazing principles. They care. They, When they were sharing these things from us, they weren't saying, here's my ticky tack list of things that I want. They were talking about their students. And um, the, the need that they see to get some of these older facilities up to date where that they can really function, I really saw from our teachers. I mean, from our principals. Ms. Cons. Ms. Martin, thank you. You did such a great job. So thanks for summarizing all that. And I just want to posit something, you know, as we look at all of this, that there's a lot of uh, mental health needs, you know, social, emotional, behavioral needs. And I just want to put it out to our community and our staff and our principals that mm -hmm. these are a lot of symptoms too. And we have to be brave enough to look at underlying causes. And so that's not for you. That's just for anyone that's listening. <laughs> um, because we're still, I'm worried we're not going to do enough for the kids if we don't dive deep enough. And so I'm just encouraging us all to look at root causes, real root causes of a lot of these things that we need to address and conserve our students better if we're brave enough to go after those conversations. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Martin. I, I greatly appreciate it. As, as you know, we have, well, you may not know this, but we have only two um, committees, board dedicated permanent committees and this is one of the two. The other is uh, audit, so DAC and audit. And I, I, I greatly appreciate it. I, I did have a quick question, and it was um, well, one uh, future things that we expect a decrease in Title One funding. Is that because we think we will have fewer Title One students, or do we think that we'll get less money from the feds, or both? No, go ahead. Okay. 
job. You did a great job. Thank you. You did a great job. So with our poverty rates and yeah, you just did a great job. That's right. Do you want it? Poverty rates? So I think you know, in June I present the title of budgets and we talk about how we are funded based on our poverty level for students ages five to 17 in our district. That has to do with what we call SAPE, which is a federal government function, which has to do with tax tax returns and of the people who live in our district. So if you drop below the 5% threshold, you only get funded in one or four categories. That's why our funding is dropped because our poverty rate is dropped. Okay. And, you, and to give you some examples of those positions, just to get a sense. So what happens is we've got uh, several intervention, academic intervention positions at Frontier, High Plains, Pioneer, Prairie Hills. So imagine that these teachers are working with students, helping them make gains, and then all of a sudden the funding spigot shuts off. So what we've been able to do, it's almost $500,000, the number of, it's a, just under 8TE, which is that teacher equivalent, which is just under $500,000, that we are backfilling this less money with ESSER because we can make a claim that due to the learning loss, we cannot afford to have these positions go away. So if our poverty rate starts to recover at some point, then so would the dollars through Title I. And so we have ESSER next year as well to cover Title, but then in September of 2024, so that 24, 25 school year, if our rate has not recovered, then we would be looking during our budget process next spring as a cabinet to determine do we need to fund these positions through the general fund or some other manner in terms of not losing the support for kids. So when you say poverty rate recovering, it, we, we <laughs> don't want that to happen. We, I don't we, want it to recover. No, but I but I also know dollars. that, for instance, at, at, yes. at Doug, Douglas Valley, it's always a challenge to get the, the parents to turn in the forms. So it, it could be just simply a lack of, if you will, forms turned in from parents because um, I know that maybe it's not. You 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 can you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I remember that was an issue at at. Uh, at but we're talking about two different things. So the poverty rate is how we're funded in different categories, and so if we're below five percent, we would have just less funding. As a district, we decide who are Title One schools, and our threshold is thirty percent free and reduced lunch. So two different things. But I thought again, I, I could be wrong. How do they determine the poverty rate? It's not based on those forms. It's based on other other demographic data that the it's feds based use. on tax returns. Okay, okay, that's good. See right. So, and and they're looking at families that have students that are ages five to seventeen. Gotcha. Okay. So, so like a couple other things too. Just one. There's there's multiple proxies. That's what gets confusing yeah. about this, right? So the proxy for Title One is tax returns. The proxy externally. The proxy we use inside the district for who receives the Title I funds are the free and reduced rates, which are based on the forms. So that's, it's both. Um, the second thing I would say is, um, and Dr. Field, correct me if I'm wrong, but for many years now, I won't define many, but more than one, um, we fluctuate, uh, the challenge is we fluctuate right around that 5%. So that threshold, we're above it. Uh, this is the first time we've dropped below it. I think twice in the last eight to 10 years, we've dropped below it and then recovered. <laughs> so this is our fifth when, time when we've dropped it. below in the last 12 years. Mm. So we just, you know, we just hover right around that 5% yep. rate. So it's kind of an on off, on off potential, which is a struggle when we're talking about recurring funding needed for positions, right? It's not we're buying new furniture and we don't have to buy next year, we're buying staff and that's an ongoing, uh, an ongoing cost. I've been on this board for over five years and I learned something every board meeting. So I, I appreciate it. And that, that may have been said and I probably forgot it, but thank you. I appreciate that. Sure. Anything else board? Thank you. Uh, next is superintendent reports. The Draft student fee schedule for 23-24, Mr. Gregory. Yes, we'll have Ms. Allen up here for 
the next two agenda items. All right, so tonight I am sharing with you the proposed new fee schedule for 23-24, and Colorado revised statute requires that the board approves this on an annual basis. Um, and this schedule is posted for our community to view, and what I'll talk about in a moment is schools also post their ind individual fee schedules. So tonight I'm going to go ahead and give you an overview of the process, provide a few examples, and the important thing to let you know is tonight, this is a discussion item only. On April 6th, uh, this will appear as a resolution uh, on your meeting agenda to consider approval. If you, next slide please, oh, I've got it. So as we look through this schedule, what you'll notice is instead of just giving you a new schedule, we went ahead and used track changes so that you could easily see what's changed. Anything in green was added as new, Anything crossed out is crossed out in red, and you know that that's been eliminated. Now, it's important to note that if a fee does not exist on this schedule, a school cannot levy that fee. The other thing is the dollar amount on this schedule is a max. So if it says art club, $20, a school can levy $20, $19, $1, $0 as well. So we have some schools who decide to go less or all the way to zero if they feel that they don't need to charge that fee. And again, once that district uh, approved schedule is, is approved by you, we give that information out to the schools and to promote transparency, our schools then go ahead and post it. Now, I'm not gonna go through all of these changes. I'm going to give a few examples and then I'm happy to take any questions that you have. So one of the things that you'll notice on page two is a bunch of cross out because we had Proposition FF that passed in November that allows for free school meals next year. So we will be implementing that and that's why you see all of those fees cross through. Next, I wanted to share with you some changes to how the athletic fees um, are organized. So if you take a look at the top there of what's crossed out in red, in the past, Athletics at the high school level were shown as ice hockey and non-ice hockey, okay? And non-ice hockey had obviously a flat fee for every particular sport that was not ice hockey. So Dr. Smith, uh, Mr. Parks, he went ahead and all of the athletic directors at the high school um, certainly contributed to this thinking was let's be a little bit more efficient because Remember, costs do go up. We know that we're looking at almost an 8% inflationary rate just this year alone. And so what Andy and his team did was develop a three-tier system, tier one, tier two, tier three, and have some differentiated costs associated for those sports based on equipment needs and other things. I also just wanted to show you a few examples on page 41 of your guide, which just shows that sometimes we have a new course that's get, that gets added. Sometimes we have existing courses and the fee just has to go up. Um, but some examples on that page are the global fluency at the top. That was a new course approved during the new course proposal process for Village High School. So they've gone ahead and, and identified a fee. Those two honors aren't integrated world history and world regional. Those are classes at Air Academy High School. They have been in place, they're not new, but there has not been a fee. And likewise, down at the bottom, you have an existing ASL class, but they are requesting, uh, it's Pine Creek specifically, requesting to change this from 20 to 40 to accommodate some additional curriculum resources. But once this is changed for all, any school can access that. Do you have any questions for me? I seem to have a lot of questions tonight. Thank you, Ms. Allen. Uh, just real quick, just for the public, we have not even been close to keeping up with inflation with these student fees. And, and I can tell you why is because we don't wanna just tap our, our parent community again and again and again. So I think it's important, you, you didn't, we didn't, you didn't show the pages of, 
of fees that kept the state the same. Yes. Probably 90 to 95 percent of the fees did not go up at all when we had inflation of, of eight to nine percent. And I think the parent community needs to know that, that we are absorbing that cost because we don't want to pass that on to the parents. We're doing everything we can to keep our costs low. And I think I think that's an important point to make. Um, what is esports? It was listed as a high school activity. I, maybe I sh maybe that's a dumb question. Yeah, so it's a new sport that's coming out. Um, electronic sports. So it's video gaming uh, that's sanctioned by Chasa. Air, air quotes around sports. You, there's a lot of discussion. Yeah. Forgive me, you are being serious. Yes. I spoke to someone recently whose kid was uh, roommates in college with a kid who had a scholarship to play esports for the university. This that's is a right. real thing that's going on right now. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm I'm old. I, I did not know that. That is that is news to me. Um, and my only co other comment was I was glad to see Auto Club and Construction Club added. I thought that was cool. I assume that's out at Liberty. Yes. Um, so that that's great. Um, any other any other comments, board? So. So you'll have a clean copy of this fee schedule on consent for your next board meeting. Thank you. Mr. Tubby, did you know what esports was? I shouldn't hold you. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I shouldn't have put you on the spot. My apologies. All right, monthly financials, Mr. Gregory. Yes, Ms. Allen, please. Okay, this is the monthly financial for February. And if we take a look at this first table, what you'll notice, if we look at our revenue, our data points between now and this time last year are so tight for revenue and expenditures. This year we've collected 38.2%, last year 38.4%. Can't get much more um, identical than that. Of course, this is a slide that you have uh, that also just gives a little bit more detail at the bottom of that slide in the text of the actual differences in some of those expenditure amounts. And now if we, or excuse me, revenue amounts is what I meant to say on this one. And then when we go to the next one, you will see that expenditures are also uh, extremely tight, just around 62% uh, now and this time last year. On page eight, you'll see this particular graph which compares our resources to expenditures. And what you can see as we've moved through this fiscal year, that gap between resources and expenditures has narrowed and narrowed and narrowed. And that happens every year. But what you are going to see when I come back next time with the next financial is March is a big month for revenue. That is when our property tax dollars start to come in. In fact, last Friday, we received $43 million in one day of tax revenue. So during my next report, you'll start to see some jumps and those jumps will continue throughout the end of the fiscal year. One other just brief note unrelated to this financial. Um, today, the Joint Budget Committee at the state level received an updated revenue forecast. I have not seen those details, but barring any unexpected delays, the long bill, which is the state budget bill, is expected to be introduced in the Senate the week of March 27th. And then that following week, which is the week of April 3rd, it's expected to go into the House. So as we start to progress down this road, we will have more and more clues as to where we can start to target in on where we think that per pupil revenue amount is going to land through the School Finance Act. The second meeting in April, I will share revenue assumptions with you, and we will also have a board work session about expenditures. Any questions for me? Mr. Gregory. Sorry, I know this is a board meeting. It's important. Something the board and Ms. Allen can take credit for, I believe, in looking at this and having a long history putting these together. This is the first year that our lines won't cross, uh, which is important because this graph is about, is about cash position. So as we've said in the past, I explained to the board many times in the past, um, there are some school districts, I don't know how many in Colorado, that are part of the state's cash flow loan program. In other words, they don't have enough because, because it's about property taxes. Property taxes are collected in the spring, then they got a, it's kind of like being a farmer, right? You collect, you harvest your crops, you sell it, and then that money's got to last you for a long time. Same thing with taxes. There are many school districts that borrow money because what they collect in taxes uh, isn't enough to sustain throughout the year. 
uh, until the next taxes are collected. So they borrow money from the state uh, to get through that period. We've never participated in that, which is good. But two, this says that we've never, our resources this year are at any point this year, uh, at all points this year, our resources are gonna exceed our, our expenditures. And I believe, you have to go back and check Becky, but I believe this is the first time, and I'm going back to like 2002, uh, that this has ever happened. That's what I mean by lines haven't crossed. Uh, so the that's only important. caveat to that is when we switch to workday, we have something called pooled cash. Yep. So that made our account look a little bigger. And so that keeps that. But yes, uh, and, and that's all a, a good um, compliment to Kathy Watts. She does a great job with our cash management and does a good job with that. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Allen. You. Legislative update, Mr. Gregory. Ms. Thompson, please. So we are just a little bit past the halfway mark on our legislative session. Um, it is our our legislature. Our legislative session is set to adjourn on May 6 this year. Uh, so at this point in time, um, I would be really remiss if I didn't give some credit to some people that help us out. Um, not just our district, but our Pikes Peak Alliance, and that is our. Uh, are people that are down day by day um, at the Capitol speaking with our representatives, and that's Jason Hopper and Eliza Schultz. They're wonderful. I also need to give um, credit to Dr. Lori Cooper, who is also helping to keep the finger on the pulse of a lot of these bills as they're passing through. Helped with some testimony on one of the bills that I'm gonna talk about tonight. Um, but I wanted to make sure that I give credit and, and appreciation expressed to people that are down there helping us and advocating being our voice while we're back here holding down uh, the fort in District 20. So, um, and also, doc, um, gosh, I just gave her a doctor, Dr. Allen, Becky Allen. Sorry, I, I just gave you an honorary. But uh, Becky Allen is also the person that organizes weekly our alliance meetings. So thank you, uh, Becky, for your work as well to keep uh, that going within our region. So on our agenda or our legislative update tonight, I'll draw your attention first to House Bill 10, uh, 231064. This was the Interstate Teacher Compact Mobility a mobility compact and this again was designed to make it easier for our teachers to come into Colorado, obtain credentials and licensure to be able to, to teach in our state. This was is really targeted towards our military spouses, um, but also people that don't have easy reciprocity uh, from one state coming into Colorado to be able to teach. Um, since I last updated the board, that has been sent to the governor. So that is really good news that it looks like it may we may be one step closer to it being a little bit easier to obtain licensure to teach in Colorado. Um, House Bill 1109 is the school discipline. It's titled School Policies and Student Conduct Bill. This bill has had a lot of feedback provided um, with the sponsors and really right now as it stands, they've, they've listened, um, which is, is nice, but nonetheless uh, with the requirements that are written into the, the bill as it was originally drafted would make it very, very difficult to expel students. I shouldn't say very, very difficult, but more difficult to expel students um, from school. Um, and really where our concerns are primarily around is this direct and substantial nexus requirement that is written into the bill. So if a student were to commit um, a dangerous act off of school grounds, unless there was a, a direct and substantial nexus back to school, they, we wouldn't be able to um, potentially discipline them for that conduct. Right now under our statute 2233-105, there are certain enumerated acts if committed on or off school grounds um, allows us to exclude the student or expel them. So under this discipline bill, 
some of that language would be rewritten and it would make it much harder putting it back to the school to show that direct and substantial nexus. And um, so, so that was problematic. There were also some other uh, points of feedback on that bill, but it is nonetheless um, making its way through the, the committee. Um, there was testimony on March 2nd, um, which again, Dr. Cooper and one of our area superintendents did a phenomenal job representing our voice um, but it's got a lot of support. And so we are watching this one carefully and seeing how that will impact uh, the way we are able to discipline students for conduct off school grounds. Um, House Bill 1142. We are all mandatory reporters, including our Board of Education directors. Um, and under current law, uh, it, there's a confidentiality aspect of mandatory reporting. It requires that we report known or suspected child abuse or neglect, but it doesn't necessarily require that the report includes the name, address, and occupation of the person making that report. So under this proposed bill, um, it would require that the report of the name, address, and occupation of the person making that report be disclosed. So there are some suggested amendments to create a task force designed to determine really if false reporting is, is commonplace. And if so, then perhaps looking at recommendations for better screening tools, overall improvements in the system, but not having to disclose right off um, the name and identity of the person making the report. So that is making its way through committee and we are watching that. Um, further down, there's several house bills that have been introduced since my last update to the board, but I'll just save time and call your attention to um, 1241. 1241 is a task force to study our accountability system and this seeks to create a task force of 25 members to, and most of that being educators to study the statewide K-12 accountability system as it currently exists. And um, when you look at the stakeholder membership of this or the composition of the 25 members of the study, um, it's seeking a lot of input from superintendents, which I commend the sponsors for putting that thought in consideration and to including our educators. However, um, our superintendents are, are really busy, so it'll be it'll be wonderful um, if they have that stakeholder input as it's designed to include. Uh, the, the next bill I'll draw, draw your attention to is Senate Bill 4, and that's employment of school mental health professionals. This has passed and has from the Senate and is now in the House. It is assigned to the Education Committee. And last update I shared with you was that the, this bill seeks to allow mental health professionals to provide services in our schools without necessarily being licensed by the Department of Education. The Department of Education, Colorado Department of Education, creates an extra layer for licensure, so it makes it a little bit harder for people that already have a, a Department of Regulatory Agencies license um, to provide mental health in schools. So this bill is moving along and I commend the efforts to make it a little bit easier to get access to mental health for our students in our schools. I would just add, Tanya, that where we talked, I think earlier, last time Tanya was here, we talked about this, that um, now that it's passed, I would, anticipate or I wouldn't be surprised if we saw other SSP positions coming forward for the same thing. School nurses, um, uh, OT, OT, PT, uh, you know, even even language, speech language kinds of things, but they've kind of opened the door with saying mental health professionals can work in schools without a license from CDE. They're still licensed, just not for education, but I would imagine that some others are now going to want the same treatment. Yeah, and those are hard to staff positions as well. So 
Um, I, I hope you're right, Mr. Gregory. The next bill that I'll draw your attention to, to is Senate Bill 23. This is CPR training in high schools. We talked about this because this bill highly encourages public schools to provide instruction on, on CPR and the use of AEDs, grades 9 through 12. It's permissive, it encourages, it doesn't require. Nonetheless, um, this particular bill was sent to the governor, and so it is on its way to becoming law. That is Senate Bill 23, the CPR training in high schools. And then Senate Bill 87 was the teacher degree apprenticeship program that we talked about. Uh, this seeks to create an alternative route to teacher licensure um, through an apprenticeship program. Uh, looks like it's shaping up to be a four year apprentice kind of on the job training program. It still has a bachelor's degree requirement. The difference or the distinguishing part of this is it would allow them to work on their degree completion at the same time of doing this apprenticeship towards licensure. So this was, um, it's moved from the Senate. It's now been introduced in the House. It's been assigned to the Education Committee just yesterday. So this one is another one that's moving along. And again, another effort to make teaching teacher licensure more attainable here in Colorado. And before I leave you, um, Senate bill or House House bill 1076, um, the para defined contribution. I would be remiss if I didn't. 1176. 1176. Has now moved to your last page. Yeah, I'm sorry. Which is all the PI bills. <laughs> yeah, this is the para defined contribution plan that Mr. Gregory talked about, uh, and he also represented our district and our region testifying on this in the committee, and unfortunately did not pass committee and has been postponed indefinitely. So, Mr. Gregory, do you want to talk more a little? No, I think it's. Uh, it's a significant change, right? Not only significant, but controversial in some some circles. Um, so I, I think I still think uh, it has a chance. Uh, I've I told Representative Wilson and uh, Jason and Eliza that I'd be happy to come back even in retirement and and help, but requires a lot of education. Uh, this was very quick. It probably needs 18 months of build up. Uh, and education uh, to even have a chance, and that didn't happen this year. But um, I would like to thank um, uh, two other folks that testified with me yesterday. One, Dr. Cooper went um, representing his current position and um, seeing some of the reaction of superintendents that come from out of state into Colorado and are required to participate in the defined benefits program. He talked about the um, you know, the options or the option uh, of a of a DC plan would allow for those folks. It's not just superintendents, of course. It could be anybody coming from out of state. I also connected in my testimony to the bill they just approved about the um, recipro reciprocity of teacher licenses. That if you're going to go there, then go another step and allow them an option to, you know, roll their retirement savings into a 401k type plan versus defined benefit. Um, but also I want to thank um, Avalon Manley. She's a teacher at Rampart, uh, went up and testified um, uh, from a teacher perspective uh, in support uh, with us yesterday. So thanks to Avalon. She, you know, it. these things took, supposed to start at 9.30. I think we got in there. We actually sat at the table to testify around two. Uh, so again, one of those one of those days that I think we actually ended at about 3.30 or 4, so, uh, but it was a good effort. We'll, we'll put that. Did you see some of our um, past students up there? Because I got a text from one of our recent graduates that said, oh, why is Mr. Gregory on the Hill today? I did they not. Were, they were up, it was some UC Boulder kids, and they were up testifying about the... No, uh, I, I, I said I did not. I saw them testifying. They testified yeah, in the education that's committee what I right thought. in front of us. Yep. Yeah, it was Camden Sharkey yep. that was there from Liberty. He did not stay around and listen to my testimony, though. He just 
<laughs> I told him why you were there. <laughs> well, thank you. I'd be happy to answer any questions that the board may have at this time. Thank you, Ms. Thompson and Mr. Gregory. I want to thank you and salute you for for doing this, trying to, you know, people like to complain about laws, but you actually try, you're trying to make a difference and try to change it. And I, I applaud you for that. I, I think it's a great idea. I mean, who has pensions anymore? You know, private, and I lost my pension 18, 15 years ago. So um, the, the option of, of a 401k is a great option. So I thank you. That was the point, right? It's not trying to take it away. It's just adding an option. And I think over time we'll get there. Uh, it'll just take some time. Agreed. Debrief board. Um, question three from the CASB self-assessment. Did board members treat each other with courtesy and respect? I felt totally disrespected that that you guys got down on my case because I didn't know what eSport was, but <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm being facetious. Um, was our business this evening focused on activities that promote and honor our mission statement, our belief statements? and our global end statement that reminds us that all students will have the knowledge, skills, and character necessary for successful transition to the next level, and upon graduation will be fully prepared for success. This meeting is adjourned. <laughs>